morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming today to this um, Capitol Hill briefing, Why Transatlantic Trade Must Play a Role in Addressing Antibiotic Resistance. My name is Bob Martin. I'm the Director of Food System Policy at Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. And uh, first, I want to um, thank uh, Congresswoman Slaughter's uh, offer to, uh, to us to uh, make this presentation today and, and help her organize this. And I want to especially uh, recognize Dr. Elizabeth Stolberg, who uh, worked very hard with uh, Tyler Smith of the CLF office to, uh, to put this together. And so we really appreciate uh, uh, being invited to do this. I'd also like to say uh, I know everybody in the room would like to express their sympathies to Congresswoman Slaughter, who, uh, whose husband passed away uh, very unexpectedly last week. And uh, otherwise, she would be here because this issue is very dear to her heart and is very important to her. So we're very, uh, we're very sorry uh, for her loss. Um, it might seem uh, odd that we talk about antibiotic resistance issues in the context of a trade agreement, but um, with the ongoing trade negotiations between the European Union and the United States, um, one of the concerns that public health officials have in the United States is that the higher uh, standards of antibiotic regulation for use in food animals in Europe would be lowered to our uh, relatively non-existent uh, standards. Uh, the way we've regulated antibiotics in the United States uh, thus far has, in food animal production has not been that effective. 80% of the antibiotics sold in the United States are used in food animal production. And uh, uh, Europe, the EU, led by uh, Sweden and Denmark, Denmark particularly in, in swine production, have cut their um, non-therapeutic use of antibiotics significantly in swine production. Um, and so today we're going to explore some of these issues. Uh, we have an excellent panel today. I'm going to introduce all the panelists, and then uh, if we could uh, hold our questions uh, until the end, uh, I'll stand back up and, and moderate the, uh, the Q&A. We have some information about anybody that wants to tweet uh, up on the board. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Lance Price. He's a professor at the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at the Milken Institute of Public Health at the George Washington University. Boy, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Lance uh, uh, received his PhD from uh, Johns Hopkins, and um, while he was at Hopkins, he was in the original cohort of uh, uh, fellows at the Center for a Livable Future. Dr. Price is among the foremost experts on antibiotic resistance in the United States, and uh, I will go a little farther than that. I'd say he's the leading uh, expert on antibiotic resistance in the United States and is really doing some cutting-edge research. Uh, Dr. Jürgen Schlunt, who's uh, got a PhD and he's also a vet, is the uh, Institute Director at the National Food Institute of the Technical University of Denmark. And uh, as I said, Denmark has been a leader in reducing the amount of antibiotics used in food animal production, particularly swine. One of the funny things that the industry always says is, oh, you, you can't do what was done in Denmark because it devastated their livestock industry. Uh, I think Dr. Schlunt will address that. Uh, that uh, fantasy. Uh, the National Food Institute is one of the world leading centers for research on antibiotic resistance and previously uh, Jurgen was the director of the Department of Food Safety and Zoonoses at the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization has now uh, suggested that antibiotic resistance has reached every corner of the, of the globe and is a problem in, in virtually every country. Uh, Karen Hansen Kuhn is the Director of International S Strategies at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and is a leading analyst uh, of the connections between U.S. trade and, ag and agricultural policies, and she'll address some of these concerns we have about uh, reducing the uh, effectiveness of EU recommendations or regulations, uh, harmonize them downward, uh, kind of a race for the bottom, as we say. So uh, first, Dr. Price. Thanks, Bob. Um, so uh, I want to just kind of set the stage for the discussion today uh, because really what we're talking about are the, the challenge that we're facing are antibiotic-resistant bacteria, also known as superbugs in the media. And 
uh, you know, they're a formidable risk to, to humans. I, I think you'll recognize that this is the world that we live in, and uh, I think those of you in this room are probably particularly familiar with this sort of cycle of some new crisis hitting the, uh, the new cycle, and then your constituents calling up and saying, do something, and then set you in motion, and then go back to their daily lives. Um, and you know, this could be gun violence, this could be weird weather events, this could be foodborne outbreaks, um, but, but this is a familiar pattern. And with antibiotic resistance or superbugs, the same pattern is emerging, but with a slight twist and an important twist and that we never go back to baseline, that this problem is getting worse. So we, of course, we have the new, new superbugs emerging. We have the MRSA strains, the, the VERSA, the CREs, all these weird names of these superbugs coming out, killing lots of people. And we freak out for a little while and we go back to our, our lives. But underlying that is, is that the bacteria are getting more and more resistant. And this is something that we have to recognize. And this is what's led the, the World Health Organization to say that we're heading towards what they call a post-antibiotic era in human medicine, where we can no longer rely on antibiotics to treat even routine bacterial infections, like staph infections, like E. coli infections. And this is, this is a, a, a scary time for medicine. And we're already seeing the sort of the front edge of this post-antibiotic era in the United States. We've already seen the emergence of E. coli strains or, and Klebsiella strains that are resistant to all of our good antibiotics. And the CDC estimates that very conservatively estimates that 23,000 Americans die of superbug infections each year. And I want to emphasize, as they did, that this is a very conservative estimate. And, and just so we don't get lost in the numbers, I'm just, you know, and I don't want to be a tear jerk, but, um, you know, these are real people, right? These are just two kids that died of MRSA infections. These are two, you know, two children of families who paced in hospital rooms while doctors struggled and failed to find antibiotics to treat their children. And so, you know, when I say 23,000, don't lose track of the real people, and let's remember that this is a fight worth fighting. So uh, the problem, you know, antibiotics are a double-edged sword. So each time we use them, they can save our lives, but we also risk generating new drug-resistant bacteria, generating superbugs, selecting for them. And so, this really underscores the need to use antibiotics prudently, to only use them when, when necessary. So bacteria can become resistant by random mutations, by picking up genes in the environment, uh, but then they become, those are sort of dead end mutations if there's not antibiotics around. But in an environment where you have lots of antibiotics, such as food animal production, then you can have this really rapid Darwinian evolution. So let's pretend this is a population of bacteria. The one with the lightning bolt is resistant to an antibiotic. If we have a lot of antibiotics in that environment, then the susceptible bacteria are going to die off, and the resistant ones will then go on to multiply. And the thing with bacteria is that they multiply by doubling, and E. coli can double every 30 minutes. So you can go from a single bac drug-resistant bacterium, a single drug-resistant E. coli, to literally a billion, more than a billion, in 24 hours. So this is a very fast, this is real-time evolution. And so again, underscoring the need to use antibiotics very prudently, only when necessary. And, and Stuart Levy described antibiotics as societal drugs to try to underscore the importance of this process of them becoming resistant and then spreading. See, they're, they're different from any other class of drug in that one person's abuse or misuse of an antibiotic can affect somebody else's ability to use them. So let's say this person is prescribed penicillin, uses them at the wrong dose, doesn't complete the, the the uh, prescription, and selects for drug-resistant bacteria in him. Those drug-resistant bacteria can then spread to his family members, to the community, to coworkers, and prevent them from using that same antibiotic. I mean, that's why we call these societal drugs. So, so think about the counterexample is Tylenol. If you misuse Tylenol, you can, you can destroy your liver and die. But that doesn't affect anybody else's ability to take Tylenol. So, so when you think about antibiotics in this context, then you have to think about how important it is where we're using them, what's the context of where we're using them, how often we're using them, and what quantities. So with that, you know, I think you know, the first place that comes to mind and should come to mind is our hospitals. Right? So we know in the United States that we're using way too many antibiotics. The industry or the associations 
with these, uh, associated with this industry, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, et cetera, acknowledge that they're using too many antibiotics, that they need to bring antibiotics down. They're using 7.7 .7 million pounds. And we know that if we have bad hygiene in these hospitals, that the bacteria can spread and kill, kill patients. So this is, this is a, an industry that acknowledges they have a problem and, and would describe this hospital as unhygienic if doctors were not routinely washing their hands. So 7.7 .7 million pounds. Then we have the food animal industry that's using four times, nearly four times as many antibiotics, 29.9 million pounds of antibiotics. A lot more antibiotics, a lot more driving force for those drug resistant bacteria. And then let's look at the context of how they're using these. This is not how they're using them. This is not a farm anymore. This is a farm. So this is a concentrated animal feeding operation where you know, animals spend their li entire lives crowded together, surrounded by other animals and their own feces, and being treated with low doses of antibiotics. This is a formula for drug resistant bacteria. So cattle will spend part of their lives grazing, but they'll end up on feedlots like this one. Turkeys are raised like this, tens of thousands in a house, and chickens like this. So, you know, as a microbiologist, I can tell you this is not just increasing the risk for drug-resistant bacteria. This is a tried and true formula for drug-resistant bacteria. So I, I just want to take a minute and, and just contrast these two environments. Here at the top, you have an industry that, that recognizes that antibiotics, misuse of antibiotics selects for drug-resistant bacteria, that hygiene is critical, that you have to prevent the spread of bacteria and drug-resistant bacteria, have entire teams dedicated to making sure that surfaces are clean, that, that doctors, nagging doctors to wash their hands. And then down here you have an industry that uses four times as many antibiotics that would consider hosing down this environment periodically to be hygienic. So this is a hygienic environment if we're hosing it down periodically and then promotes the use of antibiotics at low doses to routinely prevent diseases. Now, if I was to go up in front of my colleagues at the Infectious Disease Society of America and say, hey, people, when they go into hospitals, they get infections. I think we should treat everybody with a low dose of antibiotics to prevent that from happening. I would be kicked out of the IDSA. I'd be made to wear a dunce cap by the American Society for Microbiology and I would be mocked in public constantly. Yet this is the justification for millions of pounds of antibiotics in food animal production today. And we cannot accept this. And, and I just want to underscore, this, is, this goes way beyond growth promotion. So the FDA has their new guidance and they're trying to get growth promotion under control. But they have this massive loophole, which is routine disease prevention. And we have to get that under control. Because if we're still using millions of pounds of antibiotics to raise our animals, we're still going to have lots of drug resistant bacteria. And bacteria don't care what you call antibiotics. So this is the problem. Bacter animals like people have trillions of bacteria living in and on them. When you feed them antibiotics, you're going to select for drug resistant bacteria. Those bacteria can contaminate the pork chops. The, the environment, the people working around those animals, and go on to cause drug-resistant infections. That's the problem. But I don't want to be totally doom and gloom, and I'm really happy that my colleague Jürgen Schlunt is here today, because in Denmark, I've seen evidence that by controlling antibiotics in human medicine and controlling antibiotics in food animal production, you can bring down resistance dramatically. And that's a place where they have really low drug-resistant infection rates. And so I'm really happy we're going to hear from him. So, so we can control this, but we have to take action because there are new bug, bugs coming up all the time, and they're killing lots of people. So how do we do this? We recognize the value of antibiotics. Stewardship, antibiotic stewardship, bring antibiotics down in, in human medicine and in food animal production dramatically. Raise animals in a way that doesn't make them sick, so you don't need antibiotics all the time. Increase hygiene and animal production and, and the way we produce our foods and in our hospitals and our homes in our environments. And of course, we need new antibiotics. But if we continue to introduce antibiotics to the system that we have, we're going to continue to have resistance. And we're going to continue to see new bugs that are resistant to these new drugs. We have to change the system. And we have to do it now. And so here's my dream. And from my time in Denmark, I can tell you it's a reality. Uh, you can remove antibiotics from food animal production. You can still compete on a global market. Uh, the Denmark is first or second pork leading pork exporter in the world. They compete on a global market without routine disease prevention, without growth promotion. You're still going to have bacteria on your pork chops. You still have to handle those well. You have to wash your hands. You have to cook them well. You're still going to have people that get sick 
and get exposed to those bacteria. But when those people get infections, you can treat them with those antibiotics and save their lives. And so that's, that should be our shared goal, and I hope that we'll get there. Thanks. Good morning. I'm from Denmark, so I'm a little bit slow, as you can see. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we've been here some times uh, talking about the experience that we have because we believe that uh, the experience that we have can be used in other parts of the world, including in the U.S., since most of what we are doing actually comes from good thinking in the U.S. Maybe also in Sweden, but we don't, want, we don't like to say that. <laughs> Sweden was part of Denmark once. Um, they broke away. They found, yeah, whatever. Here, here's uh, the, the reason that we think we should move things in any area in relation to food based on science. Uh, and I think uh, some a wise guy here uh, who's actually a Mexican who worked as a Minister of Health in Mexico. He also worked at WHO as an Assistant Director uh, General. And he's now the, I guess he's still now the, the Dean of Howard School of Public Health. You have all these good Mexicans coming over here with smart ideas. This is one of them. Uh, and and this, I think this is, he's exactly hitting, hitting the nail, how do you say that in English? Yeah. He hits, the nail on the hitting the nail on the head, okay. <laughs> Old Danish saying. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just to put you in the picture of the Danish system, again, something that we learned from the U.S., we are separating risk assessment from risk management. At least I'm saying that, that we are learning it from the U.S. This is what the U.S. tells us to do. This is not what the U.S. is doing itself, but that's another story, and we don't need to discuss that. So everything is floating in a sea of risk communication, but we have a separate thing, which is risk assessment, which is dealing with the science, uh, what the science says, and that's what we're doing at the National Food Institute. And then we have another institution, the Veterinary and Food Administration, who will look at that advice and then make the decisions based on science and other events. So we are only talking about the science. Uh, we're talking about uh, what is really the burden in relation to food, and in many countries we are still under the, the impression that, uh, well, food is basically safe. Here in the US, food is safe. In Denmark, food is safe. No, it's not. Uh, we know that uh, the estimation from the US is that just from microorganisms, ordinary microorganisms in food, two to 5,000 deaths per year in the US, in the EU, a bit more. Uh, this is an estimation uh, in, in the EU basically extrapolated from the US. As I said, most of the good thinking comes from the US. Uh, chemical risks, we don't even have estimates, not even in the US. I'm just estimating that it's just as much as micro, and it might even be significantly more. So we're talking about a significant portion of people who actually die from ordinary food, uh, and, and, and we should really be serious about that. Then, of course, antimicrobial resistance, you already saw the 23,000. In the EU, it's estimated 25,000. They're still conservative. It's a lot of people. And of course, we don't know which fraction relates to food. And it could be it's 50%. It could be it's 30%. I, I have no clue, basically. We don't have science to say that. Yet, we have ideas of how we could get that estimate in the future, but we don't have science at the moment, I think. Is that correct, Lance? OK. I just al always check with Lance if, if it's correct. Um, so what is the importance of the food reservoir? Some, some say that, well, basically it's nothing. It's only the, the human use that means something. That's basically industry organizations saying that. And then other people are saying, okay, but if we try to use risk assessment to estimate, for instance, uh, what would be the outcome or what is the outcome of using cephalosporin in chickens alone uh, in, in Europe, then you're talking about 1,600 deaths alone from that. And this is estimated, and this is scientifically estimated, and is published uh, last year. So 
clearly, uh, there is a big debate ongoing, and it's uh, very difficult to just move in that debate and say, I know the truth, because who knows the truth? Nobody, until we investigate. So we will just continue to investigate, also in Denmark, to try to get better estimations. But you can see there, some of these problems are serious problems, also in relation to what's in the food. Uh, and this is not only some small North European country saying that. This is uh, experts from all over the world. And, and the first joint uh, expert meeting on that clearly said this, that there is the clear evidence. And, and some of the things that, that happens is infections that would not have otherwise occurred, increased frequency of treatment failure, increased severity of infections. And this clearly is something that happens because we're using antimicrobials in the animals. So basing ourselves in the notion that we need to have the data in order to uh, act in a sensible way, it was decided in Denmark back in 94, 95, we need data both from uh, the veterinary side and from the human health side, and we need to put them together, and we need data both in relation to the resistance level of microorganisms in animals, in food, and in human, but also in relation to the use of drugs in animals and in humans. And all of this is put together in Denmark since 94, and there's a, this Denmark report out every year. And as you can see down here, the running cost of running this is actually not so much. It's around 1 million US dollars, which is, of course, a lot of money in Denmark. But in the US, it's not. No, it's not a lot of money. Uh, it's, uh, and, and the thing is, a lot of the data here is data that we had anyway. It's just the, they were not put together in a sensible way before. So the good thing here is that we are now putting them together so we get the full picture. The start of acting is back in the 90s, and one of the first things that happened in Denmark was that we said, cannot be that the veterinarian who is out there dealing with antimicrobials, dealing with sick animals, is actually making money from selling the drugs. The veterinarians before 94 in Denmark were basically drug dealers. Okay, I would never say that outside this room, of course. I'm a veterinarian myself. I might get killed by the veterinary mafia. <laughs> well, actually, a Belgian veterinarian was killed when he said something, somebody, something didn't like. You don't know this? Uh, okay. Well, can be dangerous to say things like that. But it was decided in Denmark, veterinarians should make their money from good advice, not from just using antimicrobials. So you took away the right to make money from selling antimicrobials. And as you can see here, it resulted in a dramatic uh, reduction, actually only that. So 30 to 40 percent just by saying veterinarians, do what you're supposed to do, advise the farmers, don't just spread antimicrobials in the farms when it's not necessary. So that was the first step. The second step was to look at the antimicrobial uh, Growth promoters, so antimicrobial growth promoters were banned uh, yeah, in, in, a, in a sequence, doesn't matter. But around uh, late 90s was banned uh, the use of antimicrobial growth promoters. And as you can see, uh, yeah, as you can see, the, there is a dramatic reduction in the total use. You can also see that the, then after that, we're still increasing again. Down here, the black is human antimicrobials uh, and, and then animal, uh, and you can see we are not uh, as dramatically different uh, from the U.S., uh, but, but still a little bit uh, lower. Um, but the real thing is, what happened then was not that the Danish pig industry went down, and pig industry in Denmark is big. I mean, we've got for each person, we're not many Danes, for each person we have like almost six pigs. So we have 30 million pigs now and only five million people. Yep. <laughs> Pigs are more important than people in Denmark. Uh, but after the, after the uh, drop of the antimicrobial growth promoters, the only thing that's happened in relation to the number of pigs, you can see it was like 23 million, now it's close to 30 million. The only thing that's happened is that the production is increasing, dramatically increasing. So when we go to meetings in the US or elsewhere and somebody says, it went down the drain. This is totally wrong, and this is uh, this is from Nature. I mean, I mean, it's not just from a stupid Danish journal. 
that nobody reads. Uh, so th this is trustworthy. But you can also see that there is still an increase here in uh, the level of, of, of use of antibiotics per kilogram meat. So something continuously needs to be done. We cannot just say we need to do one or two things and then everything is fine. And therefore, uh, around 2010, uh, the yellow card system was introduced. So it's in the US, you have to say the yellow flag. The yellow flag, yeah, the yellow flag system. So if you are a producer or a veterinarian and you're using more than your neighbors, somebody will come and give you a yellow card, which doesn't really mean anything apart from that you will discuss with them and say, you know, maybe if your neighbors can do it with less antimicrobials, maybe you could also do that. And, and uh, strangely enough, that actually worked. At least it worked for one or two years. So you can see here again, it's a significant reduction just by discussing with people, just by trying to make the point. So I'm not saying that this will, again, I mean, things will change and we have to uh, find new ways of doing that because it's not going to continue like that. There will always be, you know, it'll go back again, there'll be more use, and you have to have new initiatives to keep it down. Then the other argument that we are often met with is that uh, the, 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 the system is really not sustainable in the long run. But, but if we look at the daily gain, the two things that the farmer is interested in is daily gain of the weaners. You can see that it was going down uh, before we dropped antimicrobial growth promoters, and from there, it's been going up. Uh, and, and this is clear, you know, even a Danish kid would understand that. I tried it with Danish kids, they understand. If Danish kids understand it, everybody understands it. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that's a problem in pig production is wiener mortality. And you can see the wiener mortality went up and continued to went up, go up, but then it's gone down. And this is clearly it's gone down. What's happened here? In my opinion, and our opinion, because the veterinarians were focusing on management and improving management, which takes time because you have to change the way that you are growing the pigs, then after some time you improved management and then you have the reduction in the, in the wiener mortality. And it was a number of different things that you had to do and it took time, but now it's reducing. So you actually you have a more efficient production now than you had before with less use of antimicrobials. So next step is looking at the critical antimicrobials because, of course, first we looked at the, the use uh, in, in general in, in, uh, in all herds uh, of antimicrobial growth promoters, but we also wanted to focus on some of the critical uh, antimicrobials. And cephalosporins and fluoroquinolones were treated in different ways with different uh, initiatives, legal restrictions, uh, approval of other antimicrobials that are alternatives to fluoroquinolones or a voluntary ban on cephalosporins. So it was, some of it was legal action, some of it was voluntary bans. And you can see here the reduction in macrolide resistance after uh, there was this uh, um, voluntary uh, action on that. Last thing is ESBL problems, the extended spectrum beta lactamase. Uh, Lance also talked about that. It's been growing, it's a major problem in humans, uh, and it's spreading all over the world. And as you can see here, suddenly we found it in Danish chicken. Uh, we were following everything here, then suddenly in 2011 we found uh, ESBL in Danish chicken. We've always had it in imports, we knew that. But what happened there? Because, and we got a little bit confused, Danes easily get confused, because we hadn't used cephalosporin in, in, uh, in uh, poultry for a very, very long time, for 10 years. Why suddenly would we then have it? Well, it of course comes from Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> then we talked to the Swedes because we speak almost the same language, but uh, then, then we found out that actually it wasn't the Swedes. It was from the UK because the grandparent animals actually come from the UK and they use cephalosporin there. So it, even if we're doing good things in some countries, we will move problems from other countries into that problem. It could be in the food, it can be in the live animals, and we have documentation for that. So reflections is that if the US and the EU could actually harmonize their efforts in some way, it would be good for these two areas, but maybe also for the rest of the world. And just reminding everybody that China is coming into play. 
And they might weigh in on the US side, but they might also weigh in on the European side. So even if you were just thinking about the US uh, position that we need to maintain, you know, you, you should also think 10 years into the future and think about some of the big powers moving up, including Brazil also. Uh, other things are gonna happen. We think we have arguments for uh, the European way of looking at it, uh, and, and, and then there'll be you know, some sort of a big fight on that. Uh, hopefully, science will come, come, up, come out on, on top. So integrated surveillance is what we need. We need to phase out non-therapeutics uh, and growth promotion. And then, of course, prescription only. That's very clear. Uh, you need that all over the world, and that's a big problem in other parts of the world. Continuous improvements is, is the way. That's what we've said since we set uh, uh, ashore from the Danish shores and moved out and helped other people around the world. As, okay, we, we have a bad uh, reputation for that, but they did other things than rape and pillage. They also built cultures like in York or Russia or France. They did lots of good things also, the, the, the Vikings. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I work on a lot of issues related to trade and food systems. Yeah, sort of the short approach. Okay. Um, and I think listening to these speeches, I think perhaps the most positive impact of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, on these issues is that we have events like this, that we learn about what's happened in Europe, about advances there, and perhaps it inspires us uh, to make progress in the U.S. We're at a really important moment uh, in trade policy. We have two massive trade deals underway. The US and EU together make up 50% of world GDP and 30% of world trade. If you add in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which we're negotiating with 11 other countries, what we're talking about now are rules that could affect really the totality of global trade for decades to come. Now, if you talk to trade activists and analysts in the U.S. and E.U., um, you'll hear pretty much over and over again these three sets of issues. The key is transparency. We do not actually know what's being negotiated in these trade agreements. The negotiations are happening in secret. Um, so what we know is based on bits of leaked text. There does seem to be a fair amount leaking from the European Union, more than normally. Uh, conversations, industry proposals, so we're piecing together what information we can find. It really doesn't have to be that way. At the World Trade Organization, country negotiating proposals are posted online. When we negotiated the free trade area of the America, when that was going on, um, negotiating texts were published online with brackets, so you could see where there were points of disagreement. So we could focus in on exactly what was happening. Um, but that's not the case with this round of trade agreements. They are not publishing text. So two issues that come up, I would say one that doesn't come up as much in the case of TTIP is tariffs. Tariffs between the U.S. and EU are already pretty low, between 3 and 4 percent on average. And that's a difference that with some minor fluctuation in the exchange rate, that's just gone. So really what we're talking about are issues around in foreign investment and this whole question of regulatory coherence. So on investment, uh, when I hear people have that, that panic moment, it is often around this investor state dispute settlement clause. This is a provision in trade agreements uh, that allows foreign investors to sue governments over any kind of law or regulation that undermines their expected profits. Uh, it really is an outrageous provision, and I would say unnecessary in this trade agreement. There have been many cases. I want to highlight a few that I think are relevant for public health. Uh, under NAFTA, uh, the metal clad corporation sued the Mexican government over a, a community's refusal to reopen a toxic waste dump because of public health and environmental concerns. The company won that dispute, so um, Mexico was forced to pay $15 million in compensation. Right now, Philip Morris is suing the government of Australia over cigarette packaging laws. Now, I think one aspect of this case that's interesting is that in the free trade agreement the U.S. has with Australia, 
Australia refused to sign on to that kind of provision. It said its legal system was perfectly capable of dealing with any disputes. I think that's certainly the case between the U.S. and Europe. Uh, but in any case, this has been included. In that case, since, us, since Philip Morris couldn't go directly through the U.S. Uh, treaty, they went through a bilateral investment treaty uh, between Hong Kong and Australia, where, where they had a subsidiary. And uh, currently, in Germany, uh, in the wake of the Fukushima disaster, Germany decided to phase out nuclear power. So now they're confronting a lawsuit from the Swedish firm Vattenfall for $5 billion. So in each of these cases, governments have taken actions designed to improve the environment and public health, and they face these expensive lawsuits. The issue of regulatory coherence then in some ways comes up in the investment chapter because there is this possibility of the suits, uh, but it is also coming up in some different ways. We're all already seeing some changes happening in anticipation of the trade agreement and the, the press releases we're seeing from governments indicate that this is politically seen as a part of advancing the trade debate. Uh, the EU bans um, chlorine rinses of chicken. They say instead chicken has to be produced safely in the first place and just rinsed in plain tap water rather than the chemicals that we use in the U.S. Um, but just a, a month or two ago, they made some preliminary changes to allow for certain other chemical rinses to be used. We're starting to see changes like that around the margins that are weakening standards in the EU uh, as a way to, to create momentum for the trade agreement. The U.S. and EU are already bound under specific sets of rules at the World Trade Organization. There's a chapter on sanitary and phytosanitary standards, another on technical barriers to trade. The rules in TTIP would go beyond that. So what do we know about this regulatory cooperation chapter? This is a cross-cutting chapter. The idea is it would affect a, lo a range of different issues. Um, a lot of what we know is based on a leaked EU position paper from a few months ago, uh, and then also looking at some of what, I what different industries have proposed, but, but primarily that EU position paper. And I think the issue we're most concerned about is the proposal for what they're calling a regulatory cooperation council. This is a council that would, um, that would vet potential rules coming down the line. So it could be at the state level, at the federal level. They, regulators, legislators would be required to report to this council so that, for example, if there were progress or an idea in the U.S., regulators in the EU uh, would have a chance to weigh in on that. We're concerned that this could really slow down the process. Um, it, uh, there are also provisions causing, calling for cost-benefit analyses of any kind of provision, uh, regulatory provisions, and trade impact assessments. And our concern there is that while, of course, it's important to assess the costs, uh, as we've seen in the case of Denmark, a lot of times it's hard to know exactly how things, these things are going to play out. Um, and, and most of these assessments really undercount the public health benefits or environmental benefits of these kinds of changes. Um, so, oh, and I guess just one more point on that issue. As I said, this is based on preliminary information. Two weeks ago, 170 organizations in the United States and Europe sent a letter to the trade negotiators specifically on these issues, saying, this is what we think is on the agenda. And it asks a series of eight questions to clarify exactly what they're talking about with regulatory coherence. Um, I think it would be great if folks in Congress would stay aware of that and perhaps even ask some questions on their own. So on steps forward, I think the evidence we've seen so far is that in these trade agreements, the effort really is not to raise standards, but rather to find ways to reduce costs. Um, what's more important, I think, is to find ways uh, to advance standards on both sides, in the U.S. In, and the EU, on different issues, traceability of food animals, uh, different issues that have come up today. In some ways, as I said, TTIP creates a possibility, a, a political space for us to learn from what's happened in Europe, not that everything's perfect there, but to have these kinds of dialogues to explore new solutions. In that sense, I think it's pretty positive. But the fact that the negotiations happen in secret mean that even if we we had some really great proposal for how these issues might be dealt with in the context of the trade agreement. It enters into this black box where there will be trade-offs against other issues. And we don't find out what happens until the end when it comes back to Congress. So the process is really flawed. I, I would say um, that you know if, if we want to think about international spaces where we could find changes, 
the World Health Organization is a really great place to start. They're, they're already starting to deal with these issues, thinking about a global plan of action. I think the, uh, the agreement on tobacco control that was achieved a few years ago has already led to some good changes and new approaches. But in those cases, they're really focusing on precisely the issue that needs to be dealt with in a space, in a space with the expertise that's necessary to make those kinds of recommendations. So as I said, uh, I focus on a range of issues. I would say for those interested in trade, I don't have a lot of time. I would just flag that there are a lot of I other issues on the table that need to be talked about, and these are some of the organizations uh, you might want to talk to, and that these things are all happening now. Uh, we think that TTIP negotiations will be completed by the end of 2015. What's on the table right now is fast track. This is the authority the administration requests to negotiate trade agreements in secret and then bring the resulting agreement to Congress for an up or down vote, no amendments, limited floor debate. It's stalled for now. Um, we think a different kind of approach, one that opens up the process, uh, would be much better. But that's what's really on the agenda right now. Uh, and that, you know, there's always talk of movement on fast track, perhaps after the elections. Um, but these are issues we should be following, both in the context of antibiotic use, but more broadly, in what it means for the kinds of regulations we're able to implement on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I would say Citizens Trade Campaign is a really great clearinghouse for information on all of these issues. It's a multi-sectoral coalition that involves unions, environmental organizations, digital privacy organizations. We're a member as well. So that's a good space to look for information. And of course, on these agriculture issues, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Much, uh, Lance Jurgen and Karen. I, we've heard how antibiotic resistance uh, can be created, and we've learned what Denmark has uh, done to try to control the use of antibiotics in food animal production. And we've now heard, uh, even though this seems like an obscure avenue to be concerned about antibiotic resistance, it's a very important avenue because of the lowering of or harmonizing standards downward worldwide as a potential but also the potential, I think, for uh, a company like Smithfield to perhaps bring suit uh, about uh, production practices in Denmark after an agreement's in place uh, that, that could impact standards. So really, uh, I, th I think all, uh, all three uh, presentations were very well done. Um, so now we'll open it up for questions. Um, if uh, you want to um, ask, uh, I any of the panelists question, raise your hand. I'll recognize you. And if you could state your name and your organization. Yes. And, and who you want to ask a question to. Yes. Hi. Sarah Boren, representing Food and Water Watch this morning. Um, my question is directed at Dr. Schlemm. Um, although I think everyone was speaking, um, Food and Water Watch, we're a consumer advocacy organization. So we work to translate these issues like to a level that your average person in the grocery store can understand and possibly be and I'm just curious, you know, you're coming at this from an academic regulatory level, what your sense is of the Danish consumer's understanding of this issue, and if it's talked about, you know, in the popular media, that kind of thing. It's, it was talked a lot about in the 90s. When the regulation was introduced, uh, there was a lot of debate because scientific data showed that when you're using antimicrobial growth promoters, you create uh, vancomycin-resistant uh, enterococci. Okay, you don't need to get into the technical thing about that, but you know that some of these will kill people in the hospital. So it's, it's I mean, ordinary persons, including Danish kids, would understand that when you create them in, uh, in the agriculture, they can also affect people in uh, the hospitals. And when you hear that some die there, there would, was this crisis thing, you know. So there was debate uh, in Danish society, and I think the farmers also participated in that debate. And I think uh, the good thing was that the, the, the solutions were actually debated between the authorities, the scientists, and the farmers, and uh, w with a little bit of consumer voice. Consumer voice in Denmark is not as strong as in US, by the way, uh, but because I think a lot of people in, in Denmark or Europe would say, well, governments should take care of these things, so why do you need consumer organization? It's a different way of uh, thinking. But uh, I think the, the decision to do something was because you had the debate based on scientific data. 
And then people uh, accepted that, yes, it seems to be part of the problem, so why don't we try to deal with it at the source, and that would be uh, in the farms. Yeah, I, I cannot uh, say that there was, because I don't have that th th these data. You, you have to realize that in relation to human data, in relation to the, the reason for humans dying, th there's not a very good system, not even in, in Denmark. So you, you will have death, lots of death, that are not recorded uh, as per what is the real reason. I think that might also be the case in the US. Uh, so it's very difficult to have data like that. That would have been perfect to have, but I can't claim that we have them. We have a relatively low resistance level in pathogens isolated from humans compared to other countries. I can say that, but I can't say that you can see direct uh, effect like that. We don't have data for that. I would guess that that happened, but we don't have data. But in, yes, in other EU countries, when they, uh, when they decreased the use of avoparsin, which is an analog of vancomycin, they saw substantial decreases in, in what's called VRE, vancomycin-resistant enterococci, carriage in the, pop, in the community, but also then decreases in VRE yeah. infections in hospitals. So yeah. there was a substantial decrease there. The, the, the Danes, I, I think the, the Dan map was really led by the vets, and so they had really great data on the animal side and, and less good data on the human side. But in the back row. I'm Mae Wood from NRDC. Um, could you talk a little bit about the types of changes that the Danish farmers had to make in order to um, accommodate the change? I think maybe even Bob could talk about that because he was in Denmark and he knows more. No, uh, the uh, changes, you know, all in, all out, uh, uh, making sure that you have space enough for the animals, cleaning between uh, in and outs, um, making sure that you have a sufficient period, a weaning period. You know, weaning period has gone down all the way to three weeks now, and maybe even shorter some, some places. And, and clearly that's an issue because you get a lot of uh, death in the, the production because the, the piglets don't get enough resistance from the milk of the mothers because they are taken away from the mothers uh, after only three weeks or even less. So I think that was one of the, the key things. But the other things were also very important. So you had a number of management things that were introduced over time, like some of the ones that I, I mentioned here. And then you had the change away from the veterinarian just using antimicrobials to a veterinarian is instead forcing the veterinarian to do what he or she is supposed to do, which is advice on good management. And, I'm, and I know that that's, I mean, we were told 40 years ago on vet school that that's the way you should do it. But the thing is, for other reasons, including that if you make 50% of your salary from selling drugs, why would you not sell drugs? Plus the other thing, which is also a, an issue with the human use uh, for medical doctors, it feels so much better that you have done something. Okay, so you get to a problem or you have a kid come to your uh, medical uh, consultation and, oh, the, the, the parent will say, you have to do something, you have, you know, my, my kid is... It's very difficult to say, well, I won't do anything because it won't help and maybe it will do things worse in the end. So it's easy, it's an easy fix for a veterinarian or a medical doctor to, to actually give antimicrobial, even if he or she knows that it's not really going to help and it's probably going to create a problem elsewhere. So I can understand the vets, you know, they made money from this and it's an easy fix in your collaboration with the farmer. And therefore, I think it's very important that you take away that incentive for the veterinarian. And I think that was a key thing. And it was done not only in Denmark, also in the other Scandinavian countries, including Sweden, uh, and they did it before us, I'm uh, sorry to say, but, uh, but, but uh, when we say this in Europe, in the other countries, they, they, are, they are not uh, accepting this. 
uh, we have all strange arguments from veterinary side that cannot be done outside uh, Scandinavia for some reason that I don't understand. Well, I mean, currently we're trying to treat them with older drugs sometimes, which are, have toxic side effects. And so, but we ex accept those, that collateral damage to, to save the patient. Um, that's, a, that's kind of a sad state to be in. I mean, one of the, you know, so for years we've been worried about MRSA, right? Methicillin resistant Staph aureus. The new scourge, the new really scary bug is Versa, vancomycin resistant Staph aureus. So, MRSA was that staph that's resistant to one of our best antibiotics. Versa is staph aureus that's resistant to one of our worst antibiotics. And yet, that's the one we're really scared about because we're so out of last choices, right? We're, we're, we're running out of last choices. And so we need new drugs, but we also have to find ways to prevent the, the selection for these drug-resistant bacteria. And again, decreasing antibiotic use everywhere is the way to do that. Yeah, that's uh, the the one thing I mentioned was the yellow card, uh, which was introduced, and and it and it seemed to work at least for some time. But uh, we we are seeing it rising again. So you have to continue to do something. But there's very good, very encouraging uh, data from the Nether Netherlands and Dutch are almost the same as Danes, isn't it? Uh, from the Netherlands, where they have actually done um, some specific issues related to. Uh, informing veterinarians and informing farmers, and they have, uh, I think it's a 60% reduction over a three-year period, which is really dramatic. Basically from, well, introducing several uh, features, but, but the most important ones, I think, is the focus and focused information to veterinarians and to farmers. And, and uh, so it shows that you can, you can do this in many different ways. Uh, and, and you might want to find the right way for, for, for your country or your part of the country. But, but, uh, but clearly you can do something and it will work and you will get a reduction in the total use. We have seen that in many different countries. Yes, back row. So you have two questions. Is uh, the first one is um, about, you know, let's say we can just break down that 30 million pounds of antibiotics and say what percent of those are being used both in human medicine and animal production? Is that yeah. basically the question? I think, you know, so if you remove a drug class, the ionophores, uh, which is an odd class of antibiotics that they use for growth promotion and animal production, um, and we don't use for human medicine, we're still we're still somewhere above 20, uh, 20 million pounds of antibiotics that are in the shared category of drugs that are used in human medicine and drugs that are used in animal production. So that's still a lot of really important antibiotics being used routinely. Tetracycline is an example there. Um, and, then, and then your second question, remind me again, sorry. Oh, the raw, the raw chicken question. That, that's something that comes up all the time, right? So it's, you know, it, the Foster Farms solution to their outbreak of drug-resistant salmonella was that the American public needs to cook their chicken better. But we have 
2.6 million cases of Salmonella and Campylobacter infections in the United States. Most of that's coming through poultry production. So, poultry exposure. So, if you know, and, and people know they're not supposed to eat raw chicken or, or you know, turkey sushi, right? But, um, but it's that handling of those products, bringing that raw product into your house where you can have cross-contamination in your kitchen that these microbes spread, right? And so, so yeah, we can, you can cook that, that chicken really well, but when you open up that package of chicken, have you done this? You know, you, yeah, right, you get that liquid, you get those bacteria on your hands. Even if you're super careful, you go to wash your hands, you turn on the faucet, you contaminate the faucet, you pump the soap, you contaminate that, you wash your hands, sing happy birthday, shut off the faucet, you re just recontaminated your hand, you go to make a salad, you can spread those bacteria around. And I'm really careful, right? I'm a microbiologist, I'm really careful, and I guarantee you, I don't guarantee you, I bet you could find bacteria from food, from meat, from poultry in my house because I prepare those products. But, yeah, just this comes up many times, and I think it's very important. Consumer should also do something, and we should have simple messages. And you have that in in the U.S. You have four simple messages or three. In WHO, we created five messages, simple messages. So, and everybody should know that in the kitchen, and most people do. And in relation to this, is especially uh, separate raw and cooked. And, and lots of people say, yeah, of course, da, of course, I knew that. But the thing is, you, often you use the same cutting board for the chicken, the raw chicken, and then after that you put salad on that because or you, might even, you might even flush it with some water because then there's nothing left, is there? And there's lots left. And that will go into the salad and then you'll eat it in the salad even though the chicken is totally well cooked. There, there are other uh, issues, but, but that's the main issue. So unless you had a hospital-like uh, system in your kitchen. You will never be able to make food without having contamination. And therefore, uh, consumers should do the right things, but you should also look in the chain. And if you can actually, early in the chain, prevent salmonella, why shouldn't you? So prevent the salmonella has been taken out of Danish eggs. Danish eggs are now free of salmonella. Totally. And you can do that. Uh, Danish uh, poultry 20, 10 years ago was 40% salmonella. Now it's less than 1% salmonella. Does that help? It helps a lot. So you can actually, you can do something early in the chain. And the, we're kind of saying the same thing in relation to resistance. If you try to do something early in the chain, it's actually very sustainable in the long run. Can you imagine when we now have a system in Denmark to produce eggs without salmonella? We just maintain that system for the next 100 years. And we have no salmonella from eggs. We will have it from other... Uh, and from imported stuff from elsewhere. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, I think, so in the CDC report, they also acknowledge that there's 410,000 drug-resistant salmonella and campylobacter infections each year. And, and the resistance there can be traced back to um, historic or contemporary use of antibiotics in food animal production. So that's, that's the population of Miami, basically, 410, 410,000 people getting drug-resistant infections, largely due to antibiotic use in food animal production. But there's also been a historic ignorance of of the relationship between things like E. coli, that, that you know, E. coli kills 36,000 to 40,000 people in the United States, uh, causing urinary tract infections, kidney infections, blood infections. There's been a hysteric ignorance of understanding the connection between the E. coli that's circulating in food animals and contaminating most of our meat and poultry in the United States, and those 
E. coli causing infections in people. And there's more and more evidence that that is actually bridging too. And now we also have very clear cases of people getting livestock associated MRSA. You know, MRSA and, and or E. coli and staph are the two biggest bacterial killers in the United States. And so there's more and more connections there. And, and as Jurgen mentioned earlier, you know, as we start to use these more advanced genomic techniques and start to quantify that relation, uh, relationship, we're going to start to understand more of that. But I'll just tell you, we'd need a time machine to quantify the total burden of antibiotic use in food animal production because we've been using them since the 1940s. We've generated new strains of antibiotic resistant bacteria over those decades that in some cases have likely spread to people, and we then lose that connection. So we're never going to get the total quantity. But what's very clear to everybody in microbiology is that the more antibiotics you use, the more antibiotic resistant bacteria you're going to have. So we need to bring down all use in the hospitals, on the farms, both. We have time for one more question. Yeah. of the antibiotics and the animal food production, which is the issue. But one of you alluded to or talked about the, um, the use of antibiotics and new antibiotics. And my understanding is that pharmaceutical companies are no longer making them and that there's not much incentive for them to make them as well because there's a lot more money in other types of drugs. I'd, just, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that forefront. Well, I, so, so there was a period definitely where, where new antibiotic innovation was plummeting at the same time where we're seeing these superbugs emerging. There's, there's been a lot of uh, new incentives to try to get uh, drug companies back in the, in the business of developing new antibiotics, and, and, and so we hope that there are some coming into the pipeline soon. Um, but I can tell you that right now there's not a lot of new drugs coming through the pipeline. I, and again, I, I think that's part of the solution. But, but, you know, we've had new drugs. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in the 1930s. They were introduced into human medicine in the 40s. He warned us about resistance right then. You know, when he got his Nobel acceptance speech, he, when he gave his Nobel acceptance speech, he warned us that we would have resistance. He'd already seen it in the lab. If you use them at the wrong concentrations, if you overuse them, you're going to have resistance. And so we saw resistance, and so we had a new antibiotic. We saw resistance to that, we had a new antibiotic. We had resistance to that, we had a new antibiotic. And we've been, we've been chasing this, this dragon the whole time. But the part, problem I see is that we keep introducing those antibiotics to this broken system, and we started relying on the antibiotics uh, over hygiene, over all these lessons that we'd learned a long time ago in our hospitals again and in our farms. And so we need to embrace those lessons of hygiene again. We need to, we need to really recognize the importance of antibiotic stewardship everywhere. And we need to come together as, as a, a globe and recognize the value of these drugs and say, we're, we need to save these. I'll just say one more thing and then I want to pass it to Jurgen because he always has something funny to say and important. Um, if, we, if the food animal industry put as much effort into embracing this need to reduce antibiotic use and started innovating ways to raise animals to prevent them from being sick without antibiotics, if they put as much vigor into that as they do in making animals, breeding animals to grow faster, to, to meet the exact fat content of the demand of the public, et cetera, they have this constant breeding program to, to increase efficiency. If they took that same vigor and said, we're going to develop a system to not use antibiotics, we would have a system without antibiotics, and we would have fewer drug-resistant bacteria. And so I, I just wish they would do it. I mean, I want some good old-fashioned American innovation here. In, in the EU, you have a presidency of each of the countries. It uh, turns around, so you have half a year of being a president. Uh, Sweden was president four years ago. They took up antimicrobials. The main issue, they said, was to create new Antimicrobials, just y your question. Two years later, Denmark was uh, president, also took up antimicrobial, but we said no matter whether you could find 10 new fantastic antimicrobials, you would still have to consider how you limit the use of these or how you only use them in humans and not in animals, which really makes sense, you know. And that's the, the critical uh, antimicrobial thinking that, that WHO is arguing that we should do. So in this case, just in this case, I think the Danes were smarter than the Swedes. <laughs> <laughs>
That's a great note to end on. And I, I want to thank the panelists again for coming and thank all of you for uh, coming today. And also, again, thanks to Congresswoman Slaughter for sponsoring this hearing today. We appreciate it very much. Thank you.